<laughs> Excellent. So uh, uh, we have been looking at the uh, introduction to the uh, Sanasana Sutta. And uh, so this is just the starting point. And uh, as I have just shown you, uh, there is a very strong connection between the Sabhasava Sutta, the, all the defilements, and the Noble Eightfold Path. They are basically the same thing, yeah? seeing different, different vantage points, uh, and this kind of expands our appreciation of what the Dhamma really is about. Uh, so what I want to do now, I want to have a look at the short sutta that actually talks about the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, it talks about the Noble Eightfold Path from a point of view of like a metaphor or a simile. These are simile, this is like an extended simile for the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, I don't know about you, but I have found that in recent years that I'm often very uh, inspired by the similes, the metaphors of the Buddha, and recently also the verse. Some of the verse is beautiful. It's just really inspiring and it gives you a a different feeling for the content of the suttas. It's like uplifting and beautiful, and it, it has an emotional effect that often the prose does not have. The prose can be very, maybe a bit dry. I don't know what you feel like when you read the suttas, but sometimes it gets a bit dry, whereas the actual metaphor is much more... Uh, uh, the metaphors are, have that kind of uh, something extra to them yeah, that inspires you and drives you onwards. I hope you feel the same way. So we're going to have a look at this next sutta, which is called Nymphs. So, uh, Bobby, if you can please uh, go down to the next sutta, that would be great. Uh, nymphs, here we are. Yeah, so this is the sutta of Nymphs. Uh, and uh, you will notice this, uh, it has the... Uh, uh, reference there, SN 146, uh, and SN is uh, the Sangyuta Nikaya. These are the connected discourses of the Buddha. And one is the very first uh, chapter in that book. And uh, uh, this first chapter is called the Deva, Devata Sangyuta. So this is all about connected discourses, about the gods, yeah, about the divine beings. Uh, and it's about the divine being speaking to the Buddha. And very often the divine being, they speak in verse, yeah, and then the Buddha replies in verse, and it's kind of this beautiful connection, yeah, with, with they, they talk in verse to each other back and forth. It's very, it's quite inspiring. I would really recommend many of you to read this particular Devata Sangyuta, because some of the verse there is actually very inspiring and beautiful. Huh? And uh, just in case you don't know, the, these suttas can now be read on the internet, yeah, they are available on websites, especially the website called suttacentral.net, suttacentral.net, and you can find all the suttas right there. Or if you have Bikibodhi's translations, you can use Bikibodhi's translations. So there's many different ways of accessing these suttas now. Well, this is the 46th sutta of the Devata Sangyuta, yeah? And that's why we find it. It's called Nymphs. So, what does this sutta have to say? So here we go. This is the, uh, this is the content of this particular sutta. Um, uh, re resounding with a host of nymphs, uh, haunted by a host of demons. Uh, this, grove, this grove is to be called deluding. How does one escape from it? So that is the Devat, Devata speaking, and then the Buddha replies. Uh, the straight way that path is called, uh, and fearless is its destination. Uh, the chariot is called unrattling, fitted with the wheels of Dhamma. The sense of shame is its safety rail, uh, mindfulness its upholstery. I call the Dhamma, the charioteer, with the right view running out in front. One who has such a vehicle, whether a woman or a man, has by mean, means of this vehicle drawn close to Nibbana. So, uh, uh, this is one of many uh, suttas like this, which have also symbolism for the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and let's just start from the beginning again. 
So uh, at the beginning, it uh, talks about resound resounding with a host of nymphs. So if we can please go up, Bobby, to the top again. Uh, resounding uh, with a host of nymphs, yeah, haunted by a host of demons. Uh, this grove is to be called the Lewid. How does one escape from it? What does this mean? Uh, and uh, we have to remember here that we are talking about devas, yeah, so this would probably be how the devas, uh, maybe how they experience the world, yeah, the host of nymphs. Nymphs are usually uh, divine beings that are maybe very beautiful and attractive and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then you might have some demons around. Right? What is the word for demons here? Pisarcha. Okay. So it would also probably be some kind of, possibly some kind of heavenly beings. Uh, yeah. And uh, so you are, this is what the heavenly world is, might be like, yeah, when you are kind of sporting around and enjoying yourself and all of these kind of things. So, um, but of course, this is not just about the heavenly realms, it's also about the human realm. Now. So here you can see that nymphs is really a metaphor for all the beautiful things in the world, yeah? The host of nymph is all the, uh, the large quantity of beautiful things that we can see in the world. Uh, and there is a lot of beautiful things to be seen, yeah? Things that aren't attractive. Uh, but uh, they are not just things that are attractive. Uh, there's also the host of demons. Uh, and this can be perhaps be understood as all the negative things in the world, the things we don't like, the things that we find unattractive, yeah? So we're running around in this world, yeah, sometimes being attracted, sometimes being repelled, our emotions being there, always being pulled around by uh, the causes of the world, the things of the world, uh, and very often it's very unpleasant. We are sitting there in the middle, our mind is never at peace, never still, never in equanimity, because the things of the world drive us around like this, in a way, from, from the beautiful, repelled from the ugly, and never really resting, never at peace, never at ease. And then it says that this grove is to be called deluding. Yeah, it is, we are deluded by these things. It, it is a, it's like we, we don't really understand the We keep on running after these things. And even though there is so much problems in this world, even though we can never really get to those things that we want, even though they never give us any true satisfaction, we keep on running after them, yeah? And the reason is because we have this vested interest. We have this feeling that these things are important. This is me, this is mine, I'm attached to this, I am the owner. And because of the sense of ownership, because the sense of being in charge of things, being able to procure all the beautiful things in the world, uh, being able to let go and dismiss all the bad things, uh, we are deluded. Uh, we think we can actually find happiness in a place uh, that is, it is impossible to really find any lasting happiness at all. It may, may be happiness in between, uh, we all know there's happiness in between, uh, but it can never be grasped, it can never be held on to. Uh, in the end, it will always be out of your grasp, always be problematic. Uh, and this is why this is so, uh, this is why it is deluding, yeah, because of that interest causes us to think there is happiness when in fact it's not. And so, this Devata, this uh, uh, being, this heavenly being or divine being, uh, uh, it has understood that there is a problem. Uh, and now they come to the Buddha and they ask the Buddha, how do we escape from this? Uh, how can we break through the delusion? How can we stop being always being at the mercy of the beautiful and the ugly things of the world, never finding any peace, trying to um, uh, desperately running after this mirage, this mirage, this uh, trick of the senses, which isn't really real, and that gives what it actually it is supposed to, uh, that we think it might give us. And of course, the Buddha. Uh, talks about the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah, you can call it the Dhamma, if you like, or the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the answer. And this is how the Buddha describes the Noble Eightfold Path. The straight way that path is called, and fearless is its destination. The chariot is called unrattling, fitted with wheels of Dhamma. Yeah, the uh, 
First thing here we have, which I think is very interesting, you have the path is called the straight way or it's called straight. And uh, this is a very important uh, point, first of all. Uh, because uh, uh, what this shows us is that if you want to practice to Nibbana, if you want to achieve any of the things that the Buddha says you can achieve, uh, you have to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. That is the best way, that is the straight way. There isn't really any alternative way. There might be longer ways, there might be detours, but if you want the straight way, this is the one. Yeah, there isn't any alternative. There isn't like a sevenfold path, which is faster. There isn't a ninefold path, which is faster. It is the eightfold path that is the straight way. This is what would get you to the goal. Yeah, there is not anything else. And you have a problem there. And this is such an important point when it comes to the Dharma to remember that. Because everybody wants shortcuts. Everybody wants the fast way. And the I always like to say that uh, one of the ways that I like to understand the history of Buddhism, the history of Buddhism can be understood as the history in trying to find shortcuts to the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, now, if you look at, uh, uh, for example, you, uh, uh, there are so many examples of people who had seven factors on the path. Yeah, we our uh, samadhi isn't really required because samadhi is too difficult or may not be required because right view is, you know, it doesn't fit our modern ideas. But also historically, you know, historically we went from Theravada to, uh, to Mahayana. And one of the things about Mahayana was the arising of the Bodhisattva ideal. And it's not maybe a faster path, but it is an alternative path. And then the Vajrayana is a way of making the Mahayana path faster yeah, by using all kinds of tricks of the trade and to make it go even faster. So in some ways, we have been looking at trying to find different paths, yeah, or paths which are faster. And this is almost like the history of Buddhism, is that idea of finding a path which works better than an old life for path. What we need to do to reject all of that, uh, we need to come back to these eight factors. And uh, these eight factors, it does, doesn't necessarily mean that we should be... It doesn't mean that we should be uh, rejecting of Vajrayana or rejecting of uh, uh, other you know, paths or whatever. What it means is that all of these various schools of Buddhism, they have the Eightfold Path in there. So we all need to go back to the earliest part, uh, the core teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, then we are on the right track. Yeah. So it's really about understanding the Noble Eightfold Path in the right way. And when you understand it in the right way, then guaranteed you will have a success in practice and you will find so much satisfaction, yeah, happiness, all good things of this particular path. Then it says that fearless is its destination. Uh, actually, what the, I think it is better to say that uh, fearless, like Direction is fearless. The Pala is Disa, and Disa is direction. Yeah. So uh, uh, the direction of the Noble Eightfold Path is fearless. So when you move according to the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, uh, anything that you do that has to do with the Noble Eightfold Path is fearless. Fear never arises as a consequence of the Noble Eightfold Path. Fear is in the world. Yeah. Fear arises because. We have belongings, and because we have belongings and don't want to lose those belongings uh, because we cling onto them, uh, we fear that they will be taken from us. Uh, yeah, we have no choice. Yeah, we have no choice to be fearful of that uh, because uh, uh, that is what it means to be an owner of things. Uh, so the world is, feel is fearful. The world is always dangerous. It always feels that we're going to lose our possessions, lose our life, lose our loved ones, lose our mind sometimes. Yeah, when you go a bit funny, if you when you do something silly. Uh, but the Dhamma is the opposite. Uh, whenever you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, you're always moving towards a lack of fear. It's a safe path that we feel good about yourself. Uh, it leads to all the opposite things. Uh, or what the world leads to. And that chariot is called unrattling. It is not a chariot which kind of is unsteady or unsure or uncertain or it might fall apart at any particular point. 
it is a solid path. Though. And if you practice the path correctly, and that is really the critical issue, yeah, by practicing it correctly, really understanding what it is about. Uh, once you understand, really understand what it is about, uh, what it means to have Yonisomanasikara, what it means to guide your mind, uh, attend in the right direction, when that happens, uh, then of course it will work. It is not rattling, it is a solid path which leads in the right direction. Uh, fitted with wheels of the, the Dhamma, uh, Dhamma here can mean two things. It can mean the teaching of the Buddha, but it can also mean like good qualities, you know, fitted with wheels of good qualities. And Dhamma has this double meaning in the Pali language. And, and uh, in, in a sense, I think that's true. If you want to have success on the Buddhist path, uh, you have to have as many good qualities as you can possibly have. You have to be kind, uh, you have to be caring, uh, you have to be generous, uh, you have to be compassionate. You have to have a degree of equanimity in your life, not reacting too much to things. Uh, and when you have all of these uh, beautiful qualities inside of you, then uh, the uh, chariot gets that speed where, that we can only have with wheels. Uh, we can imagine a chariot without wheels. It doesn't go anywhere. It is stuck in the mud, stuck in the ground, stuck in the dust. Uh, nothing happens. Uh, but when you have wheels on the chariot, uh, the chariot goes forward. In the same way, if you uh, practice the morality in the right way, you have the good qualities in the right way, your meditation and your wisdom take off. Without that morality, without that, uh, uh, all the good qualities inside, you're not going to go anywhere. So it comes back, and this is such an important point, and I, 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 I just like to make this point again and again because I know how important it has been in my life, yeah, in my own practice. Uh, the idea of always asking yourself, what can I do better in the way I think other people, uh, in the way I relate to the world? Uh, how can I have more kindness, not only superficial kindness, but deep kindness inside, yeah, where we are really driven by kindness? Uh, if you have to force yourself to be kind all the time, you have to sort of uh, say, uh, grit your teeth and really try to be kind. Uh, then it is um, painful to be kind. So you want to make it more natural. And the way to make it more natural is to ask yourself deep down, how can I look at people in a new way? How can I have that intention to be kind almost at all times within me? So I never really have to think about it. But the goodness just flows out if I understand how, uh, uh, because I understand deeply why this is so important. And then you are fitted with the wheels of Dhamma. Yeah? You want to make those wheels as big as possible because when you have big wheels on the chariot, it is going to be much faster. Tiny wheels are going to slow the chariot down. Big wheels are going to make it go really, really fast. So build up those good qualities. Make the wheels really massive, yeah? really large diameter with all the good qualities inscribed on the rim of that wheel. So everything is there. And then that is when you have a chariot which actually will uh, will take you somewhere okay then we have the idea that the sense of shame is its safety rail yeah what is it that keeps us safe in this world and the suttas often talk about two things that keep us safe these are uh, shame and fear consequences called Hiri and Otapa, Otapa, Otapa in the Pali language. Yeah. And uh, shame, what does it mean? It means basically, I think, what we mean by shame in English. Shame means like if there is something you don't want others to know about, yeah, about you. If, if someone says something about you that, uh, and, and you think, oh, no, I hope they didn't say that about me. That is because you have a sense of shame about something, yeah? Probably something silly, but um, that's how we are as human beings. We don't want others to, to know about our little secrets or whatever. And uh, that is when you, you, know, you do something which isn't quite nice and someone else finds out and you think, oh no, and you feel a bit shameful about that. Uh, that is a sense of shame. And, uh, you know, in the modern psychology shame often considered bad there's no need to feel any shame because shame is kind of a, a negative thing but i would say it really depends it depends why you feel shame and how you feel shame 
if you feel shame for stupid things, yeah, if you feel shame for things that are just uh, uh, kind of socially accepted, we shouldn't be doing this because it is bad or whatever, you feel shame for really stupid things that have nothing to do with feeling shame about, uh, then it is problematic. Yeah? But if you feel a little bit of shame because you don't want to do bad things, uh, then I think it's a positive emotion. Yeah. If I feel that I do something bad, I think, oh, well, I hope Ajahn Brown doesn't find out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> Yeah, then that is a positive thing because that will actually keep me on the right track. It will remind me that I've done something wrong. If I don't have that shame, if I think, yeah, whatever, I don't care, I don't wrong, I can find out, it doesn't matter, I don't care about my own behavior, then it is a problem. Yeah, we don't have that barrier that stops us. So fascinating here that the shame is considered a safety realm. But be careful, use that sense of shame in a wise way. Don't feel shame about stupid things, yeah? things that are just uh, conventions in our society. We say, oh, you mustn't do that. Why? Well, because this is just what we have decided, but nothing to do with morality. You don't really have to feel shame about that. But shame about being kind, yeah? being moral, is actually a very positive thing. And it stops you to go outside of the safety rail. If there's no safety rail, you will fall out of the chariot. Yeah, If you fall out of the chariot, you're not going to go, go anywhere. Yeah? So don't be afraid of that. Then we have the uh, beautiful idea that mindfulness is the upholstery, the parivara it is called here. Yeah, it is like the, like the requisites or something of the of the chariot. And, uh, and there is another beautiful set of verses also about the path where they say that non non-desire is the upholstery, yeah? So very similar, but there it is non-desire, here it is mindfulness. And of course, mindfulness and non-desire are very closely related to each other. But if you think about non-desire, first of all, you know, in our world today, very often we uh, we tend to lift up desire as marvelous. Oh yeah, desire is great, it gets you going and we should desire things of the world and as you enjoy yourself, the things of the world yeah desire is lifted up on the pedestal as if it is something beautiful there but the reality is that if we desire we're also going to be restless because desire is precisely not being content with what you have and if you're not content with what you have you are by definition restless if desire gets stronger than that not only are you restless but you're also agitated and this feeling of agitation is actually very unpleasant. Uh, yeah, you know what it means when you're agitated, you can't find any peace, uh, and you kind of your whole body and your whole being is kind of you know shaking a little bit, and it's really unpleasant. Uh, agitation is a very unpleasant state. Uh, and um, so, and this is what comes with desire. Desire, the more you understand it, uh, it is actually an unpleasant state of the mind. Uh, so, whatever there is no desire. That is like you are at ease, you are relaxed, yeah, you are feeling it, you're feeling comfortable. And this is why non-desire is the upholstery here. Yeah? Because non-desire, you can really relax. Oh, no desire. You're not driven around by craving, you're not driven around by this desire which whacks you over the back as a whip, yeah, and kind of drives you on, moves you around all the time. No, instead you have the non-desire that makes you really. Chillax, really be at ease and really enjoy yourself. It's marvelous, isn't it? It's so beautiful when you think about it. And it's so obvious too, when you really understand what is going on here. So in this case, though, no, it is mindfulness. And mindfulness is very closely related to non-desire because the more desire you have, the less mindful you're going to be. So by withdrawing from that desire, yeah, not having that best interest in the world, you're going to be mindful instead, and you're going to have that clarity of mind. That you know what is going on, and you feel when you have mindfulness, you're going through the world in a smooth way, not being buffeted around by desires and aversions, but you have this smoothness in your life, yeah, when you're just moving around at ease with upholstery. You have an upholstered existence. You don't need a comfortable chair like, or whatever it is. You don't need these kind of things because you have the inner upholstery of the mind for mindfulness instead. And um, 
the uh, you know mindfulness has a, a lot of good qualities. It is said that you can never really have too much mindfulness. So it is always very um, always useful. Uh, and uh, one of the things it, it says that mindfulness gives gives you this adipateya. Adipateya means like you become in charge of yourself. Yeah? When you are mindful, you feel you can react to the world in the way that you want to. Why? Because you are aware. You know what's going on. You can feel what your mind is doing. Am I becoming upset now? Is desire coming here? Am I looking at the right thing here? Yeah, Yoni Somanasikara. Why is attention is right there behind the mindfulness? And the two together, the wise attention and mindfulness, they kind of lead you in the right direction, heading towards, uh, uh, heading in the right way. You feel like you're in charge of your life. Sati Adipateha. You are, uh, you, you are um, in charge through mindfulness yeah, of your own life. So uh, this is all really good stuff. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, someone way, way in just confirmed uh, the sutta. Uh, so thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I'm amazed how you got that so quickly. So that's, that's really, really remarkable. But that's exactly the suit I was looking for. You know, the, the, the manga sanghuta number four. So that's quite much. So that is the mindfulness here. Yeah? And then you have the, the Dhamma, which is the charioteer. Yeah, the Dhamma is sitting in the seat. The, the Dhamma is what guides us. Yeah? Like the charioteer guides the chariot. Uh, so you are the Dhamma, is like you start out. As being, so, you drive in the right direction, and as you do so, you gradually take on board this Dhamma and it becomes part of who you are. Yeah, yeah with right view running out in front. And uh, of course, right view is running in front. Why? Well, because it is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Without that right view, without that uh, uh, beginning to see things in the right way, then you're not going to head in the right direction. So for the chariot to go in the right direction, you have to have the right view running out in front. Uh, and remember, one of the most important things that we can do, and I, I really hope we will get this out of this retreat. This is not really uh, so much a meditation retreat. It is mostly a retreat about suttas and how to establish an understanding of these teachings. And, and what I really would like to see is a stronger sense of view that you feel you understand these teachings better by the end of this, this, uh, these four days. Yeah, that is really what I'm aiming for. And of course, I hope to uh, benefit myself as well. Yes, I, I wouldn't call it selfish, but I, I want to bring my own benefit into this as well. So we can all benefit together. I think that is the best way of doing these things. Uh, so right view is running out in front, but the stronger that right view is, uh, that, the better it will lead us in the right direction, the more powerful it will be in guiding us in the right way. Yeah? So we need to make that right view stronger. And that, as I said, is what we're trying to do now. And then the Buddha says very beautifully at the end here, that one who has such a vehicle, whether a woman or a man, has by means of this vehicle drawn close to Nibbana. One who had such a vehicle, well, we all have it uh, more or less. Yeah, we, some of us have it, uh, some of us may have it more, <coughs> excuse me, some of us less. But uh, <clears throat> I think the point here, the reason why the Buddha is mentioning this is because it, to really have a vehicle like this means really to be a stream mentor because the stream mentor has internalized the noble eightfold path, so they have the vehicle fully, and that's why they have drawn close to nibbana. Yeah, uh, the rest of us, it really depends on how strong the vehicle is stronger. Yeah, and you kind of the factors are greater, then you are closer, but if they are weaker, then you are further away. Yeah. Okay. And so whether you are a woman or a man, so you, here the woman comes first, man comes second. So it's nice to see that there is a bit of, sometimes uh, women come first, even in the suttas, I think that's an important point. I, yeah, so uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if, I think sometimes maybe as a woman, you might feel a bit left out because it seems to be so focused on the bhikkhus, 
the monks and it has a kind of very maybe centered on male experience perhaps uh, but please don't feel left out yeah this sutras are is for everyone it doesn't matter and I, I really hope you don't feel left out because that would be a, a terrible thing if that was the case uh, so these are certainly for everyone uh, and you have drawn close to Nibbana, and I always prefer to translate this word, yeah, Nibbana. I always like to use the word extinguishment, because Nibbana is precisely that. It is the extinguishment of greed, hatred, and delusion. It gives a very great clarity to what Nibbana is about. Okay, so that is that little sutta. Um, let's take a five minute meditation break just to kind of get a bit of clarity that I will let you know when we come, come out again. So let's just have a quick break just to uh, give our brains a little bit of uh, space. <clears throat>
Okay. So this is a <coughs> let's carry it on. I'm just going to have a little bit of coffee because coffee kind of keeps me keeps me going. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. I think I might be addicted to coffee. I'm not sure, but I hope you will forgive me that addiction. I mean, a little bit of, I don't know, just uh, gives a bit of extra oomph sometimes. And that's why I like to use it. Uh, anyway, so we have just looked at this uh, little sutta on the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, yeah, the Nymph Sutta. And uh, again, again, I just find these things very nice and they're very, you know, there's so much meaning in there. It's such a short little sutta, and there's so much meaning to be drawn out. Uh, and I would, uh, I don't know if you find it inspiring, I would really recommend you to go to those places where you find these suttas with verse yeah, and try to read them for yourself. And, and you may actually find that it is really inspiring. It really gives you that energy and joy on the path, but otherwise may be difficult to uh, to find. Uh, yeah? So let's see, see what works. We all... You know, we all take in different ways, we all work in different ways, so you have to kind of try to find out what uh, what is your kind of thing. Yeah. But what I want to do now is to uh, look at the uh, uh, first factors of the path, the yeah, right intention, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And these are found in the uh, uh, in one sutta called the Great Forty, which we're going to look at now, the Maha Chattari Saka. Sutta in Pali, and um, uh, and uh, uh, this sutta is uh, quite interesting in a number of ways. I'm not going to go into great detail. Maybe we could uh, investigate this sutta at, at one point more. But this sutta has some very strange elements to it. It has some elements that look like abhidhamma. Yeah, we can. Some of the vocabulary, if you know the Pali, for example, you can see that the vocabulary resembles some of the Abhidhamma vocabulary. And so it seems to me that some parts of the suttas was like maybe the beginning of the Abhidhamma. It came, maybe this was added to the sutta because of this sutta is quite different in the Chinese. So it may be that some of these Abhidhamma elements were added sometime after the time of the Buddha. Yeah, to the Pali school because it do not exist in the Chinese translation, uh, which is from the uh, Sarvastivadan school. So there seems to have been a certain <coughs> divergence there in this particular sutta. But I'm not going to touch on these Abhidhamma elements. I'm going to leave that out completely because to my mind, it is not really interesting. Uh, I will show you maybe in one place what this Abhidhamma idea is about. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the other aspects of this sutta so, because, uh, again, it deals with uh, the idea of uh, uh, the first factors of the path, uh, which otherwise we would miss out on. So let's see what it has to say. Uh, so here is a translation by, this is by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi this time. Uh, Thus have I heard, uh, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaita's Grove, Another Pindika's park. So there you can see it's park before it was monastery. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is an interesting thing, a Rama, delightful place. So. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, uh, venerable sir, they replied, and the blessed one said this. Uh, bhikkhus, uh, I shall teach you noble right stillness uh, with its support and its requisites. Uh, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, the vicars replied, and the Blessed One said this. What vicars is noble right stillness with its supports and requisites? Uh, that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. Uh, and the answer is unification of mind equipped with these seven factors uh, is called noble right stillness with its supports and its requisites. Uh, so let's stop there for a minute. And um, so this sutta is really about right 
stillness. You can see I have changed the text a little bit because uh, Venerable Vicky Bodhi, he doesn't use right stillness, he uses right concentration. But I have taken the liberty of editing this text a little bit uh, because I like to present things my own way. And of course, we, we all know that Ajahn Brahm, he likes the word stillness. And I personally uh, like it too. I think it's a, it's a far better translation, Samma, Samadhi. So here we have something called noble right stillness, yeah, the Arya Samma Samadhi. Yeah. And uh, so the Buddha, in a sense, makes this distinction between uh, uh, the stillness of the noble ones, uh, the stillness that is elevated, uh, and just ordinary stillness of the mind. Uh. And um, uh, you will notice that the difference is only one thing, and that is that the noble right stillness, the real right stillness, the one that matters, uh, is the one that has stillness and also the other seven factors of the noble path. And maybe you wonder why that is so important. And the reason why it is so important, because the other seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, they include things like right view. Yeah? And right view is essential for being able to use that right stillness to gain insight. If you have right stillness, but your, your view is wrong, then insight will not come from the right stillness. But if you have right view, added to the right stillness, uh, then insight will come from that. That is when you become a stream anchor. That's when you become an arahant. Yeah? So this only becomes noble. It only becomes right uh, <clears throat> when the stillness is imbued with the other seven factors of the path. Uh, and of course, the other factors matter too. Yeah? They matter because you have to have all the, <clears throat> uh, the um, uh, factors of morality have to be part of that because the factors of morality they support the meditation practice that make it stable that make it strong and it makes it easy to reattain that it has to be the right intention in the sense that your mind has to intend in the right way you have to be leaning in the right way yeah towards nibbana in the right direction all of these things and then this becomes powerful and people often ask this question, well, you know, in the sutta, sometimes you come across the idea of mitcha samadhi, wrong stillness. So what could possibly wrong stillness mean? And this is probably what it means. Yeah? It, you are still, but you have wrong view. And of course, the consequences of being still and having wrong view is that you tend to read things into the stillness that are not there. You tend to think of the stillness as some entity. You think of it as Nibbana, you think of it as something very, uh, something that it is not. You don't really investigate it properly. You don't make it an object of insight. Uh, and then you stop, yeah? And you think, yeah, the world is eternal, hooray. I have found the everlasting mind and all of these kind of things. Uh, and then you internalize that. Uh, 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 you, you, you make this into something which actually it does, does not deserve to be taken as. Uh, so this is the problem. That is the difference between Miksha Samadhi and Samma Samadhi. And um, you also have, have here the idea of unification of mind. Yeah? Uh, the Pali is Chittasa Ekagata. And uh, this is one of the standard ways of uh, talking about uh, Samadhi in the Sutta. This is kind of the meaning. The mind is unified. The mind is brought together. It is not uh, dispersed into the external world. Yeah, going here, going there. Uh, in the five senses. Uh, so this is what it means. Uh, so this is the, uh, the background uh, to the Sutta. And uh, once this has been set up, uh, of course, now what the Buddha is going to do is going to look at what are these supports and requisites. Uh, this is the next point. Uh, so now we're going to look at the various factors of the path, uh, yeah, and especially the, the factors of morality and intention. Uh, so let's see. Uh, move on a little bit. Uh, first of all, looking at that view itself. So, so uh, view. Uh, therein, because, yeah, right view comes first. And how does right view comes first? View. And what is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed. 
no fruit and result of good and bad actions. Uh, no this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world uh, who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge uh, and declare this world and the other world. This is wrong. Of looking at the wrong view, let's look at the right view. It's always more encouraging to look at right view and look at wrong view, so we learn something more positive in a sense. Um, but uh, first of all, let's just very briefly talk about the beginning there. You know, the idea of right view coming first, and the idea of right view is that you are able to distinguish right view as right view and wrong view as wrong. View. Yeah, you understand what is right and what is wrong in the world. That is kind of the idea of, uh, of, of right view. Yeah, you, uh, you, you, the more you're moving, the more you internalize the Buddha's teachings, uh, the more clarity you have about what works in the world and what does not work, yeah? how to look at the world in the right way. And of course, if you are a noble one, yeah, then you have that full insight in, into what is right and what is wrong in the world, how the world works. And it is said that a noble person can only take the Buddha as their teacher. They cannot take anyone outside of Buddhism as their teacher. And the reason is precisely this right view. You know the truth. You don't have any doubt about it. Uh, yeah? So you can make this distinction between right view and wrong view. But what that also means is that if you haven't got right view, yeah, if you haven't got that full right view of the stream entry, it means that we are fumbling around. We don't view. Have you got right view? What would you say? I can't talk to you now. I wish I could talk to you because it would be more interesting. But uh, what would you say? And maybe you would say that, yeah, you know, we have a little bit of right view because we know about karma and rebirth. Yeah. But have you got full right view? And the answer is no, because you have to be a stream mentor to have full right view. So there's going to be a bit of delusion in there. There's going to be a little bit of misunderstanding of what the world really is like. It is not enough to believe in karma and rebirth. Believing in karma and rebirth is only the very basic ideas of existence, yeah, what the world is like. But it's all about turning your mind towards the way the Buddha looks at things, uh, understanding where the dukkha is, understanding the problems of the world, uh, turning your mind towards stillness and insight, uh, turning your mind you know, towards kindness and compassion, and all of these kind of things. Uh, that is the real profound right view. Yeah? And the ideas of karma and rebirth, uh, if you use them rightly, they lead to that. These are interlinked. Yeah? The understanding of where problems in the world are and where happiness is, is actually inter completely interlinked with the idea of even more. I may have a little bit of right view, I may have the beginning of Yomi Soma and Sikhara and Samaditi, but it's not purifying yet. And to really be able to purify it, to actually understand what really is wrong view, what is right view, I have to allow myself to be, you know, for better, for <laughs> lack of a better expression, to allow myself to be brainwashed a little bit, yeah? To allow myself to be, and a better way of putting it is, Conditioned a little bit, uh, yeah, conditioned in the right way, conditioned towards the Buddhist teachings uh, and away from any kind of uh, uh, silliness or uh, delusion that we, that we all have. Uh. So it already says something about us. We always have an aspect of right view, sorry, of wrong view until you become a stream, en stream entry. All along, that wrong view will be there. Uh. So this is part of uh, what this actually means. Uh. And then you have have as I just read out the definition of wrong view, but let's skip that a little bit because uh, I think it's more interesting to look at right view. And so the Buddha says, and what because is right view? And 
uh, right view, I say, is twofold. Uh, yeah, uh, right, there is a right view that is affected by the taints, partaking of the merit, ripening in the acquisitions or ownership, perhaps. Uh, um, uh, and there is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, and a factor of the path. Yeah, so he, he I, I mentioned before that the uh, Abhidhamma vocabulary, and here is this where we find this kind of Abhidhamma vocabulary, the idea of uh, affected by the taints, and uh, uh, this, uh, these kind of expressions uh, lean towards the Abhidhamma. They're more similar to what you find in the Abhidhamma. So I don't find that all that interesting. And then you have the other right view, the right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. Yeah, this too is kind of leaning towards Abhidhamma vocabulary there. But uh, the main point of this is basically uh, that uh, there is ordinary right view. And that ordinary right view is only temporary. Yeah, We use the ordinary right view to gain the higher right view. The higher right view is the view of a stream entry here. So we use this ordinary right view to guide us in the right direction, and then we get the higher right view, which is the direct insight into the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, It's a gradual thing. That is the main idea behind this. And that main idea, I think, is perfectly okay, Yeah, even though the vocabulary might be a bit strange. And uh, so let's, uh, let's have a look at these two aspects of right view. So, uh, so what is that right view that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, uh, ripening in the acquisitions? Uh, there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. Uh, there is fruit and result of good and bad actions. Uh, there is this world and the other world. There is a mother and father. There are beings. Uh, who are reborn spontaneously. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins uh, who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. Uh, this is right view affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions. So, so um, there you are. And uh, this is, I think, a very useful and very uh, important way of understanding right view yeah and uh, i have I, I i teach this very quite often on the retreats that i do and at this time i will only go through it kind of superficially because really we could spend a lot of time on this but i think today let's just uh, go through it fairly fast because as always time is always always shorter so uh, yeah, so the first part here is uh, the idea that there is what is given, what is offered, and what is sacrificed. Yeah, and uh, what that means is that generosity is a very important part. Of it. it very often comes first in the training. It starts off by talking about generosity. Uh, uh, yeah, these things are kind of the foundation upon which you build everything else. And, and because of that, it is a very uh, significant, a very important part of what the path is about. And, uh, you know, generosity, in fact, it is so powerful, the Buddha says that. He says that to the monastics, that uh, you should never, he says, you should never really eat a meal without sharing with somebody. If, he says, I think specifically, he says that if you understood it, the power of generosity, you would never eat a meal without sharing with somebody. Yeah, it's kind of... Interesting, right? In other words, you always take the opportunity if there is an opportunity to be generous, if there is an opportunity to share with somebody else, to be kind to somebody, you always take that opportunity because the power of generosity is so great. It is conducive to so much happiness. It is conducive to so much inner peace and well-being. It is the foundation for meditation practice. You always take the chance if you have the opportunity. So remember that. But uh, and there's lots of suttas about that. I'm not going to go into those now because, again, it, it's, uh, it's just uh, it's very interesting and very beautiful. But you can probably read about those yourself. And I've done those on previous retreats at the BGF and, and elsewhere. Um, but one of the things that I, you know, is, is interesting about generosity is that the words that are used for generosity, you have typical words. One very typical word is chaga. 
Chaga means like to relinquish something, you relinquish something to someone else. And, uh, another word that is used sometimes in connection with uh, generosity is muti. Muti means freeing, yeah, freely giving, yeah. It's actually uh, uh, muta chaga, I think the Pali word is, it literally means freely giving up or giving away, yeah. This is found in the standard uh, pseudo definitions of. Uh, uh, of generosity, uh, and then there is the word uh, vasanga, vasanga rato, uh, delighting in vasanga. Vasanga also means giving up, yeah, relinquishing. Yeah. And what is interesting about these three words, they are found in the formula, the standard formula for generosity, uh, but they are also found in the third noble truth. Yeah, the third noble truth is a noble truth about the end of suffering. Yeah is a noble truth that talks about the nature of Nibbana itself, attaining extinguishment. And the words that I use there are Chaga, Muti, yeah, and Patinisaga. Patinisaga is related to Vosaga, which I just mentioned before. They're almost the same, with slightly different prefixes. And then there is a fourth word, which is Analaya, yeah. But three of those words are very closely related to the idea of generosity. Yeah, there's almost the same words found in the third noble truth as you find in the formula for generosity. Yeah. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? And I think what is going on here is that when we are generous, if you really are generous, if you really give to somebody else, you think, wow, here you are. I want to give this to you. There's something inside of us uh, that is very beautiful, very wholesome at that particular point, Yeah, because you're giving up of what is your own. Uh, it has to be a true act of giving. It can't be, yeah, yeah, or oh, I'll give it to you. I don't really want to, but okay, oh, I'm going to give it. It has to be a true act of generosity, yeah? Really wanting to give away, understanding the joy, the freedom, the liberation of giving, and how powerful it is. And when it is a true act of generosity, it is very, it is similar in a certain way to the idea of attaining Nibbana itself. Because when you attain Nibbana, you're giving up. Yeah, you're giving up attachment in a very profound sense. When you have an ordinary act of generosity, you're giving up attachment in a shallow sense, in a small sense, but you're still giving up attachment because you're giving up what is yours. When you attain Nibbana, you're giving up in a very profound sense. But the basic idea, the basic kind of thing that we're doing is the same. Yeah. So you can see why generosity is often a very good foundation on the path, because the movement of mind that is required for generosity is very similar to the kind of movement of mind of giving up that comes at the very end of the path, when you just get rid of everything, yeah? And for that reason, you feel the highest kind of freedom when you do that. Yeah? Anyway, that is a, a, just another way of thinking about the idea of uh, generosity. But uh, remember that, yeah, that uh, always take the opportunity, yeah, in small ways, in medium ways, in large ways, but maybe especially in the small ways, uh, because the small ways are endless. There's so many possibilities of being generous in this world. Uh, you can be generous by speech, yeah, speech can be an act of generosity of giving someone uh, some beautiful words. You can be generous in so many different ways, even the way you think can be a kind of generosity. Yeah? So expand it out uh, and use it in this way. Yeah? Okay. Then uh, we have the idea that there is fruit and results of good and bad actions. Uh, yeah, so uh, remember that your good and bad acts, they really matter. Yeah, this is almost like this is, again, this Coming back to the idea of virtue again being the foundation of the Buddhist path, they matter because they make all the difference on whether you're going to make progress or whether you're going to regress on your path to awakening. Yeah, these are really, these really matter a lot. And if you are able, try to see the connection between your intentions, yeah, your um, what you are trying to achieve, see the connection between your intentions and how you feel about that. Uh, yeah? That is really the fruit and results of good and bad actions. Uh, and if you can see that connection between your intentions uh, and how you feel about yourself, uh, you will really understand this in a very deep way. Uh. Anyway, let's, let's leave that uh, for now. 
And then you have the idea that there is this world and there is the other world. So this is, of course, about the idea that there is rebirth, that things don't stop when you die, but they carry on in a certain way. And this, again, here being the fundamental part of the ordinary right view. Yeah, the idea that the life as we is so much wider, there's so much more to it. And this narrow tiny bit that we are seeing now, it kind of goes on into the past, into the future, potentially endlessly. And uh, this is another uh, important way to uh, think and to see the world, because once we uh, see the world in that way, it means that we have a little bit less clinging to this particular life. We tend to look at things uh, in a more broad picture, yeah, large way of looking at things. Uh, and because we look at things in a larger way, we make better decisions about what really matters in this world. Uh, yeah, We become more focused on the spiritual things, uh, more focused on developing the mind, uh, simply because uh, that mind, we will take it with us into the future. So again, it matters enormously. I'm always so disappointed when I hear people say that the idea of rebirth doesn't really matter. You don't have to be, believe in rebirth and these things. And I find it so disappointing because it is so fundamental to the Buddhist teachings. If you take out rebirth, basically the Buddhist teachings, they fall apart. There's nothing more to hold on to. This is one of the pillars of the Buddhist teachings. One of the critical insights that the Buddha had on his day of awakening. Yeah, on his day of awakening, he saw rebirth, he saw kamma, and he saw the ending of the defilements, awakening. The three core insights of the Buddha, if you take away one of those, uh, you have taken away one of the foundations of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so please don't do that. Uh, please be okay with rebirth. If you don't believe in rebirth, you don't have to believe in it. But at the very least, I would recommend you have an open mind about these things, because these are really incredibly important. And then and uh, try to investigate it uh, through an open mind. Then we have the idea that uh, uh, there is mother and father. <clears throat> and uh, this just means that our parents are very important. And uh, if you uh, have the ability, then uh, uh, see if you can change your attitude to your parents a little bit and see if you can give them a little bit of extra kindness and care and compassion. Yeah. Uh, don't force yourself too much. You don't have to try super hard and spend a lot of time with them, but uh, quality time, yeah? But do things with high quality. That is the most important thing. Yeah? And I think all of us, we can make a lot of good karma. And again, we can hasten the path if we treat our parents in the right way. And even if your parents have passed away, yeah, do something good for them. Yeah, they may be in some realm or they may be able to receive some of the goodness. There are beings who are uh, reborn spontaneously. And this is about the idea that uh, existence is much more than being born as we are as human beings, yeah, in a kind of physical realm. And you also have the more mental realms. To be reborn spontaneously, it has to be more of a mind made realm, and more like a mental realm, if you like it. And that is the uh, uh, why that is mentioned. It is mentioned because it makes samsara much larger, yeah, much broader, the possibility of rebirth here and there suddenly expands dramatically when you take into account the idea of spontaneous re rebirth. Then comes the last one, and this, I think, is in many ways the most important one. And there are in the world of good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. Now, this is uh, obviously a foundational right view. If you don't believe that there are people in the world who <coughs> have some kind of realization, some kind of direct knowledge, uh, if you don't believe in that, you're not going to believe in the world. You're not going to become a Buddhist. Yeah? You're just going to carry around in your ordinary life. You're going to be hunting for big houses and nice relationships. Uh, and you're going to be hunting for, um, you know, a nice, nice car or whatever it is. Uh, but you're never really going to search in the spiritual realm. Uh, because the searching in the spiritual realm really requires that there's something to be attained. Uh, and if there's something to be attained, uh, then there will be people in this world uh, who have realized these things. Uh, so um, 
uh, this idea, yeah, I mean, I must, all of you who are part of this, uh, you are already extremely fortunate. Uh, you're very fortunate because you have that basic inclination towards the Buddha. You have a feeling that the Buddha was someone very special. That's why you're interested in the suttas. Uh, you probably have a feeling that the Buddhist teaching is still alive in the present day. Uh, that you meet people who have these extraordinary qualities. And yeah, I, one of the things that I find the most joyful is to meet people with these really extraordinary qualities. You can almost see the Dhamma in some of these people. And of course, one of my heroes, this is why I'm in Perth, Rajan Brahm is one of my great heroes. And that's why I have hung around in Perth for so long. And, and why, um, I don't know how long I will stay here, but it feels like it's gonna, I've been here for 27 years, I haven't left yet, so. Who knows? But um, I do that because I feel that the influence from someone like Ajahn Brahm combined with the Sutta is so powerful. So you should feel so lucky that you have that conviction, yeah? that you have, this, you have this something which gives you a very powerful sense of meaning and purpose and aim in your life, uh, that you have this feeling of something bigger, something larger than our ordinary lives, uh, something to really aim for, uh, something which gives our life a sense of, you know, direction almost, uh, and whereby we, um, uh, whereby actually life becomes far more purposeful because of that. Uh. But what is interesting here, you will notice that the way that this is phrased, it is phrased in the way that uh, um, uh, by direct knowledge, well, what is it that they know by direct knowledge? Uh, yeah, it is this world and the other world. Yeah, this world and the other world, we just saw that before, there is this world and the other world, this is one of the facets of right view, and here it is again, the exact the same facet of the right view. What a person who is profound, who has a deep insight into the nature of reality, what they actually understand, that one of the most basic things to understand, you have it right here, is this world and the other world. They have an insight into the idea of rebirth. Yeah, this is the critical thing. So this is again very, Interesting because it shows you that real wisdom in according to the Buddhist teachings, uh, one of the fu fundamental aspects of, of real wisdom uh, is an understanding of the idea of rebirth. Uh, and without that, it is really impossible to have that full wisdom and understanding of what is going on there. Yeah, it again shows you the importance of these things on the Buddhist path. Uh. So anyway, I'm not gonna, I, I've talked about these things a lot before, and this is a very beautiful passage, uh, and I would really recommend you to read this and, and uh, ask yourself what it really means, uh, how you can develop these factors, yeah? Uh, the last factor here, how can you develop that? Well, you can develop it by reading the sutras. Uh, uh, and the other ones, well, reflect on them and see how you can bring them, bring them into your own life uh, to make them more, more real and make them more, uh, more useful. But... Uh, Let's stop there with that. Let's carry on with the, uh, the rest of the idea of right view. Uh, so um, then the Buddha says, yeah, and what because is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. Uh, uh, the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, the awakening factor, the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. Uh, this is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the path. Uh, so this here also has a very powerful Abhidhamma flavor. Yeah, all of these uh, uh, synonyms for what the path is about, all of these synonyms uh, point towards the same thing, and this is how the Abhidhamma is very often phrased. Uh, and it is not, to my mind, it, this is not very useful. It doesn't really say very much. It just says that, uh, you know, you can have, you can call it the faculty, or you can call it the power of it, you can call it the investigation of state, uh, awakening factor, you call it the factor of the path. It is the wisdom. It's just kind of adding synonyms. It doesn't really add very much to our understanding here. Uh, so the main point about this higher right view is that it is the right view of understanding the Four Noble Truths. Uh, that is what it is really is about. Yeah? 
So when you become a straight winner, you know the four normal truths. So, so that is the kind of the, the higher view here. So the question then is, is there a connection between the right view I just showed you before? Just before I showed you the right view, there is what is given, there is what is offered, etc. Yeah. What is the connection between that right view and the right view of the Four Noble Truths? So that is an important point, right? That how do these things connect with each other? And the answer is that they are basically the same. There is no difference between the two. They may look very different when you read because the way they are phrased is very different, yeah? But actually, it is the same thing. The only difference is that the lower kind of right view, yeah, there is what is given, there is what is offered, etc. The lower right view is more basic, yeah? But basically, that too is a, is a more basic version, if you like, of the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, it talks about the path to give and all these kind of things. It talks about some suffering this world and the other world it talks about the causes of suffering there is the fruit and result of what is given yeah and all of these kind of things so the four noble truths are really there but it is phrased in a different way and when you pull it apart and you look at the factors you will start to see that these things are actually the same so keep that in mind yeah reflect on that because and this will enable you to integrate the teaching more and you will start to understand what is going on there. The Four Noble Truths can be too theoretical, but when you understand them in the light of this ordinary right view, it actually starts to come alive in a very beautiful way. Anyway, let's have a look at the last paragraph here on the right view. Uh, one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one, you abandon wrong view. Mindfully, you enter upon and abide in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Yeah, so very briefly, uh, one of the main points here is that uh, uh, you need to make an effort to get right view. Yeah, you have to make an effort to get right view and you have to make an effort to abandon wrong view. Very interesting. You don't see this hardly any other suttas, uh, but you, in this sutta you find this. Uh, what does it mean to make an abandon wrong view? It means that you know when you have a problem. You know that when you're looking at the world in the wrong way. Yeah. And it means that you know that you need to develop right view. It means that you read the suttas. You listen to Dhamma talks that are about the suttas. You reflect on that and you ask yourself, how does this apply to me? How does it apply to my life? And this is how you develop these things. These things don't just happen. Yeah, You can't just uh, absorb them just like that. It is a slow process of development and reflection. So please remember that. Yeah, I've been stressing that point a few times now. But actually, it is one of the, again, I think it's very important to really be able to move forwards on this path. Then. then you have, you are mindful, abandoning wrong view. Mindfully, you enter upon right view. In other words, you have to be mindful to be aware of your wrong view. And you have to be mindful to be able to move towards right view. On top of the mindfulness, you need your nisomanasikara, because you need to be able to know that you'll have a wrong view and you need to be able to know what right view is so you can actually move in the right direction yeah and this is how you then uh, move in the right direction mindfulness and effort combine that so um that is why it says these three things they run and circle around right view so you have the right, right view which helps you develop more right view you have the right effort you try, yeah, you always try to kind of understand what this is about, uh, and then mindfulness, which tells you whether you are on the right track or not. Uh. Okay, everyone, so time is up for this session. Uh, let's have a good break, uh, a half an hour or so, and let's come back again at 3.30. So see you back at 3.30, and then we can have the Q&A session. Uh.